Hi, I'm Terry Waymire, and I head up the giving ministry in this church. Today, I'm going to read some of Acts 13. In the church at Antioch, there were prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Manian, who had been brought up with Herod, the Tetrarch, and Saul. While they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. So after they had fasted and prayed, they placed their hands on them and sent them off. The two of them, sent on their way by the Holy Spirit, went down to Seleucia and sailed from there to Cyprus. When they arrived at Salamis, they proclaimed the word of God in the Jewish synagogues. John was there with them as their helper. They traveled through the whole island until they came to Paphos. There they met a Jewish sorcerer and false prophet named Bar-Jesus, who was an attendant of the proconsul, Sergius Paulus. The proconsul, an intelligent man, set for, uh, sent for Barnabas and Saul because he wanted to hear the word of God. But Elimus, the sorcerer, for that is what his name means, opposed them and tried to turn the proconsul from the faith. Then Saul, who was also called Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, looked straight at him and said, You are a child of the devil and an enemy of everything that is right. You are full of all kinds of deceit and trickery. Will you never stop perverting the right ways of the Lord? Now the hand of the Lord is against you. You are going to be blind, and for a time you will be unable to see the light of the sun. Immediately mist and darkness came over him, and he groped about seeking someone to lead him by the hand. When the proconsul saw what had happened, he believed. He was amazed at the teaching about the Lord. This is the word of the Lord. Amen. Thank you. When you have a text with uh, all sorts of names of people in cities, you ask your mom to read for you, right? Because no one else wants to tackle that. Uh, I want to say as I began, thank you to those of you who have been praying on behalf of of the church and the people of Ukraine. Uh, I know uh, I, I talked to a lady this morning who was like, hey, I need a little more uh, wisdom on fasting. And so for those of you who have been intentional about praying for people who will likely never meet and won't see this side of eternity, thank you for investing. I want to encourage you to continue uh, that prayer. If you're a guest with us today, uh, we're truly grateful that you've chosen to join us and worship with us. Uh, we love new people. We, we love the people of God, and that comes from Christ himself. So we're grateful again uh, that you're here worshiping with us. Now, we're in the New Testament book of Acts. We've been walking through Acts for a couple of weeks now, although we started some months ago. We took a little bit of a break uh, and focused on some other series, and, and now here we are. We're, we're kind of back, and at this point, we see kind of a market change in Acts. Uh, the storyline shifts a little bit. In the beginning, um, the spotlight was on the church in Jerusalem and all that God was doing there. So I'm going to do a quick recap for you just to kind of remind you uh, of where we've been. But uh, the on the day of Pentecost, uh, Jesus had told his disciples, hey, I want you to wait for me in Jerusalem. Don't be trying to go out and heal the sick and do all the things that you've done while I'm here. I want you to wait. But when, and when the Holy Spirit comes, uh, you're going to receive power and you're going to be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria, even to the ends of the earth. And so uh, at this point in Acts, we've seen the gospel take root in Jerusalem. Some 3,000 people got saved on day one. Now, this is a church of about 500 people, um, two different campuses. Uh, things can be difficult to manage at times, right? Uh, just all the people keeping up with everybody and all the things that we have going. I cannot imagine starting, uh, beginning with zero and having 3,000 the next day. That had to be quite a challenge. But man, look at what God is doing. They had to be celebrating the work of God in Jerusalem. Um, then there was a big persecution that broke out there in the city with the martyrdom of a man named Stephen. And so believers in Jesus Christ are persecuted and they're scattered across uh, Judea, that region in the region of Samaria, kind of radiating out, radiating out from Jerusalem. But at this point in Acts, we're going to see that the gospel is going to go to the Gentiles. Now, just to maybe take you back so that you can know who God is. Um, our God is a God who loves people. Jesus said about himself, the Son of Man has come to seek after and to save 
that which was lost. That is the heart of God for people. And so he started there in Jerusalem, but that wasn't good enough, right? He, and then he went out to Judea and Samaria, but that was still, there were more people that needed to hear. And so the gospel is going to continue going to the ends of the earth. God is a God who loved us so much that he sent his one and only son, Jesus Christ, that whosoever would believe in him would not perish, but would have everlasting life. So our God is a God who goes after that which is lost. I believe we should be the same as a church. I want to say this. If you're here today and you've never trusted in Jesus Christ, I believe that you're not here by accident. If you're watching us online, I don't think that's by accident. But I believe that the God of the universe, the God of all creation, is seeking after your heart today. And he wants to transform you. He wants to give you his abundant and eternal life. Now, um, where we are here in Acts, in Acts chapter 13, I told you that everything changes. We see the heart of God express, ex expressed even further out from Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria. Now we're going to see it going even to the ends of the earth. Now, um, the commission that Jesus has given his church, that would be us, um, the commission that we have, the Great Commission, it's what our, our kind of mission statement is based off of. He said, I want you to go and make disciples of all the nations. Uh, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And by the way, don't forget, uh, I, I'm going to be with you always, even to the very end of the age. And so our mission here, we say that we want to lead all people to become fully devoted disciples of Jesus Christ. And that's true for people that show up here on a Sunday. And that's true for people who have never darkened our doors, people that we've yet to meet. We don't even know their name. We want to lead them to know Jesus Christ and to follow him. And so uh, the mission of the church hasn't changed. Like God didn't like switch things up in our generation and be like, hey, I tell you what, I don't really want you to go and make disciples anymore. I really want you to gather on Sunday. Now, our mission is to lead all people to become fully devoted disciples. And that happens here and it happens when we scatter. It, matter, it happens when we send people overseas or to other states or other places. Uh, we want to make disciples. Now, I, I tell you all of that because as we begin taking a look at this text there is what I see, it's an invitation for us to follow after Jesus. If, if Jesus was seeking after that which was lost, uh, making disciples of people who didn't yet know him, um, I feel like this text is an invitation for us to follow him in that. So, uh, but I want to give you kind of notice on the front end, um, it's not all going to be easy. So things, three things I want to give you today. Um, should you follow to G Jesus, some things that you would need to know. Um, the first of those is this. <clears throat> if you're going to follow Jesus, it is going to be costly. Look with me here in Acts chapter 13, beginning in verse 1. It says, Now there were in the church at Antioch prophets and teachers, Barnabas, uh, Simeon, who was called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Menaean, a lifelong friend of Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. Now, um, just to give you a little bit of background, this is a beautifully diverse church. Uh, you may not think, you know, you think Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, Antioch even, uh, you wouldn't have a great deal of diversity. Um, interesting, there are two Africans listed in this list, or most likely Africans. You have Simeon, who was called Niger, which means he was a black man. Um, likely from somewhere in Central Africa. We're not told that specifically, but generally that's where dark-skinned people were. You have Saul, who's from Tarsus. Uh, he's a Jew. He would have looked fairly Middle Eastern or Jewish in, in nature. Uh, he was trained under Gamaliel, and so he was a leading intellectual, kind of academic in Judaism. In his day, he was kind of big time. And then you have Barnabas. And Barnabas, man, he was an encourager. He was the guy that you wanted to hang out with. I don't know if you've ever been around people that are just really good encouragers. And I'm like, I'm like, uh, I'm like my dog, who every time I go outside and she wants me, she wants to be near me, and she comes and she pastures me and she she nudges my hand uh, with her nose because she just wants. I, that's how I feel uh, when I'm around encouragers, right? I'm like, oh come on, I need to be encouraged. So Barnabas was a guy that you would have wanted to hang out with, but then you have Lucius of Cyrene, who uh, he would have been uh, on the coast of northern Africa there, so probably a guy that you wanted to make friends with, right? Going to go hang out with him. He was a unique individual, and then you have Menaean who was a lifelong friend of Herod the Tetrarch. He had friends in high places. So you have this beautiful diversity present here in this early church at Antioch. 
Uh, but there would have been certainly more than that. Things maybe that we don't see described about the church. Uh, Luke is kind of telling the story, but he wasn't present at this point. But I'm guessing in the church at Antioch, there would have been men and women there who had come to trust Jesus Christ under the preaching of Saul who would have been encouraged by Barnabas in some of their most difficult days. What you should see here is the body of Jesus Christ that had been knit together, people with wildly different backgrounds and levels of influence in society, all of whom had been united by their faith in Jesus Christ, by the gospel of Christ. But God's going to do something that's going to be a little bit difficult. Look what, look what it says here, beginning in verse uh, we'll start in two. It says, while they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, life is good. Everyone's all together, unified. Uh, while they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work which I have called them. Then after fasting and praying, they laid their hands on them and sent them off. Again, we don't see it described likely because Luke wasn't an eyewitness to this, but rather had been told these stories. You're going to see uh, later on in Acts, he's going to describe it using like personal pronouns. Here, we're kind of hearing a third person view. But oftentimes when the apostle Paul, who's called Saul until this chapter of Acts, uh, Paul is his more Greek name, um, when he would leave places, he would leave with tears. These were people who loved one another, uh, who were close together, who had depended on each other in difficult times. If we're going to follow Jesus Christ, if you're going to follow Jesus Christ, you know, you need to know that it's going to be costly. For this church, there would have been broken relationships, there would have been tears. There would have been people in this church in Antioch who loved Paul, who would never see him again this side of heaven. They would have lost that encouragement from Barnabas, their friend. There would have been relational pain um, that was inflicted because they were following after Jesus. It would have been difficult. And here's what I would want you to know. Um, if you're not yet a believer in Jesus Christ and you're going to follow him, I want you to know on the front end, it will be costly. Matter of fact, Jesus Christ himself said, um, if you're going to follow me, you need to first sit down and consider the cost to you. Because to follow Jesus is to live a radically different life than we would otherwise, uh, which means we make him Lord of our, our life. Uh, we give our lives up in order to, to serve other people. Like following Jesus is costly. Now, I'm not trying to talk you out of it, but I just want you to know uh, where it is on the front end. It can be costly. Um, God may ask you to do things that are difficult. There may be difficulties that God allows into your life uh, that, that you won't understand all the time, but you've got to trust him through it. So if you're going to follow Jesus Christ, it's going to be costly. That's true for unbelievers. It's also true for believers. Here they lost friends. They didn't get to hang out with Saul. They lost the guy that was their encourager. There was difficulty there in this church. There would have been a big old hole that these two men left um, when they took off on their missionary journey. If you're going to follow Jesus, you need to know that it's going to be costly. The second thing, and I want you to know here, is that there will be opposition. It's not always going to be easy by any stretch. Look here in verse 4. It says, So being sent out by the Holy Spirit, um, Saul and Barnabas, they took off towards Seleucia. And from there they sailed to Cyprus. Cyprus was a big old island country. Um, and when they arrived at Salamis, uh, they proclaimed the word of God in the synagogues of the Jews. This was kind of the pattern. You would go to the synagogues first. Um, they were open to the reading and the teaching of the word. And so Saul would just jump in there and begin to preach the gospel right in the middle of the synagogue. Um, he had a bit of a name, and so people would have listened to him. And they had John. Uh, this is likely John Mark, who wrote the third gospel, with them. Uh, when they had gone through the whole island as far as Paphos, they came to a certain magician, a Jewish false prophet named uh, Bar-Jesus. This is super strange, right? So they're traveling throughout this island. They're preaching in the synagogues. And then all of a sudden, y'all, this, this happens in ministry. Can I just tell you, life is going along. You think things are going according to plan. And then someone really, really weird happens to be in your path, right? And so this guy, he calls himself Bar-Jesus, which in the Greek means son of Jesus. 
Uh, however, this guy was not on the side of Jesus Christ, all right? He's going to actually be uh, kind of a problem for them. Now, here's the good news. He was with a proconsul, the proconsul, which would have been the governor over the whole island of, of Cyprus. And so his name was Sergius Paulus, and he was a man of intelligence who summoned Barnabas and Saul uh, and sought to hear the word of God. Every now and then in your Christian walk, as you seek to follow Jesus Christ, God will take the ball and place it on the tee for you to hit, right? I, I don't know if you've ever tried to share the gospel with somebody, but usually it's extraordinarily difficult. And you're thinking, how in the world am I going to get there conversationally? How are we going to talk about Christ? And, you know, it, they're going to be upset. Just all the difficulties there. This guy, they show up on Cyprus. They've traveled to a few cities. And all of a sudden, uh, the governor's like, hey, would you come and talk to me about the Word of God? Can you tell me about Jesus? Would you mind to take your time? Just come to my house and share the gospel with me. So this is great news, right? They've got to be excited. Like, we left our friends. It was costly. But here we are. We have this great opportunity to share the gospel. Um, but that wasn't all. In verse 8, but Elamus who also calls himself Bar-Jesus, this odd magician. That's, by the way, the meaning of the name. He opposed them, seeking to turn the proconsul away from the faith. So not only is this man not a son of Jesus, not a follower of Christ, um, he's in opposition to the gospel message that's being preached. But Saul, who was also called Paul, by the way, this is where the name change happens. You won't hear him called Saul anymore throughout uh, the book of Acts. He was filled with the Spirit, and he looked intently at him, and he said, You son of the devil, you enemy of all righteousness, full of all deceit and villainy, will you not stop making crooked the straight paths of the Lord? And so here's what I want you to hear. If you're going to follow Jesus, um, while this may be a rather unique set of circumstances with a magician and the governor and all that, you need to know that there will be opposition. Jesus Christ told us, if we're going to follow him, there will be difficulty. He told us this. He said, there is an enemy out there who has come to steal, to kill, and to destroy. And the good news, he said, but I have come that they might have life. Like God loves the world. He's going after the lost person because he wants to give them life. But we would be foolish if we didn't understand that we have an enemy who is opposing us at every turn. He doesn't want to see people come to life. He wants to see them destroyed, right? The opposite of what we're seeking. And so right here, Saul and Barnabas, they've been obedient to the Lord. And immediately here on the island of Cyprus, they face this opposition. Elamus, bar Jesus, this weird magician who's opposing them at every turn. Now, we don't all get to act like Paul did here, but sometimes you might wish for this. Look what happened uh, in verse 11. And now behold, the hand, this is Paul still talking, behold, the hand of the Lord is upon you, and you will be blind and unable to see the sun for a time. And immediately uh, mist and darkness fell upon him, and he went about seeking people to lead him by the hand. Now, uh, fleshly side of me, uh, I wish I could bring down mist and darkness on some people sometimes that, that cause some trouble, right? That's kind of fleshly ways that we respond. Uh, here, for whatever reason, the Holy Spirit seems to ordain um, this negative event happening in the life of this man, but there's a purpose for it. Because look what happens in verse 12. Then the proconsul believed. The gospel had taken root in Jerusalem in Judea, Samaria, and now the gospel has taken root in Cyprus. And this is no ordinary person. This just happens to be the governor. But look at part of what God used to bring him to this place of belief. In verse 12, the proconsul believed when he saw what had occurred. Somehow, God used this man who was opposing them in order to help lead the proconsul to faith. When this man saw that, saw that Paul and Barnabas were preaching the gospel and that this other man, Elamus, who must have been his friend, had been blinded because he opposed them, man, it validated what Saul and Barnabas were preaching to him. It says that, uh, I'm sorry, then the proconsul believed when he saw what had occurred, for he was astonished at the teaching of the Lord. This is beautiful. Like, to see how God moved here. Um, the first thing I want you to know about following Jesus is that it will be costly. The second thing is that you will face opposition. 
Um, in, in your life, if you've heard the gospel before, uh, you're an unbeliever here today, and you've heard the gospel before, um, I, you've probably heard uh, things like this in your mind. I believe the enemy would wish, whisper this to you. Maybe people have validated this in your life. Um, if you're considering following Jesus, the enemy, the enemy might say, you? Are you kidding me? You know what you've done? Do you know where you've been? What, what kind of life you live? You think you're going to be like, a, you're, God's just going to forgive you and like walk away from like, no way, right? Because the enemy has come to steal, kill, and destroy, right? Jesus came and might have life. The enemy wants to steal, kill, and destroy. He is opposing the work of the gospel in your heart. If you've been a believer for very long, you've probably had the very same things whispered into your heart by the enemy, right? Like, who do you think you are to lead someone else to Christ or to, to serve in that way? You're not good enough. You're not qualified enough, right? This is the enemy opposing us. In following Jesus, whether it's trusting him in faith the first time or whether it's living a life of faith in Jesus Christ as a devoted follower of his, you will face opposition. This is the point in my sermon where I'm actually really glad because I get to quit telling you the bad news, right? There's some, some good news coming, right? Um, if you're going to follow Jesus, it will be costly. You will face opposition. But the third thing that I want you to see, the exciting part of this, is that if you do follow Jesus, what will be gained will far outweigh the costs. What we find in Jesus Christ is a new life. Do, do you remember the woman at the well? Jesus, he happens into a place in Samaria, and he goes to this city that most Jews would have avoided. And he's out there, and he doesn't have water. He sends his disciples uh, to go get some food in town, and out comes this lady at a really weird time for her to come to the well. Um, most scholars would, would, would suggest that the lady likely came to the well at that time of the day uh, so she wouldn't bump into other people. Um, she'd been around, if you will. She'd made some pretty bad choices in her life, and people knew it. So she's coming to the well at a time when other people wouldn't have come. And there she is going to draw her water. Jesus tells her about water, that if she drinks from this, she'll never thirst again. The woman who had spent her life trying to satisfy the emptiness or the pain or whatever it was that she was feeling inside, she was finally fulfilled and satisfied in Jesus Christ, such that she would never thirst again. And she goes to all of her friends and she says, let me tell you about the man that told me everything I had ever done wrong, like this man, Jesus, who, who I've found full and final satisfaction for my soul. She had spent her life life looking for this. And in a moment, she had found Jesus Christ, the greatest treasure that we could ever find. And so for us, yes, I want you to know that following Jesus is costly. I want you to know that there will be opposition, but I want you to know that what is gained will far outweigh anything that you would lose or have to pay in order to follow after Jesus Christ. Jesus describes the kingdom of God like a treasure hidden in a field. That when you find that treasure buried there, you go and sell everything that you have in order to buy that field and gain that treasure. It's worth losing everything to find it. It's not just eternal life one day. It is abundant life beginning here and now today, living out the purpose that Jesus Christ has for you in this life in the here and now. Now, I'm going, to, I'm going to get there for you. I'm going to have to do some summarizing because this is a very long chapter, okay? Uh, after the proconsul comes to faith in Jesus Christ, they actually leave the island of Cyprus. Um, they go to a few different cities, and they end up at a place called Pisidian Antioch. Not the Antioch where the church was that sent them out, but it's, this is another place called Pisidian Antioch. He went again to the synagogues and preached the gospel there. And y'all, there was this amazing response. Like uh, people in the synagogues, they're hearing the Jews, they're listening to the gospel message, and they're actually about to plead with Saul and Barnabas to continue to teach them. So uh, if you want to jump in with me, we're going to be, begin in chapter 13, verse 42. It says, and as they went out, the people begged. Well, one of y'all do this for me one day, by the way, after church, just, just, just beg. Could you, we talk about some of that some more? Just kidding. Um, as they went out, the people begged that these things might be told them the next Sabbath. So um, the, can we come back next Sabbath? We want you to teach again. We want to hear more about the things of God that you've been, been telling us. And after the meeting of the synagogue broke up, many Jews and devout converts to Judaism, they followed Paul and Barnabas, who, as they spoke with them, urged them to continue in the grace of God. So the next Sabbath, almost the whole city, 
city gathered to hear the word of the Lord, right? This is big time, right? The whole city is showing up and they want to hear the gospel preached. They want to hear this message once again. Did I mention that if you follow Jesus, sometimes you'll face opposition? Because here it is again. Verse 45, but when the Jews saw the crowds, they were filled with jealousy and began to contradict what was spoken by Paul, reviling him. Last week you were asking us to come back. You wanted to hear more. What in the world happened? The whole city was gathered here to hear the gospel. Now these dadgum Jews are standing up and telling people they shouldn't listen to us, right? There's opposition that's happening in their city. Verse 46, And Paul and Barnabas spoke out boldly, saying, It was necessary that the word of God be spoken first to you, since you thrust it aside and judge yourselves unworthy of eternal life. Behold, we are turning to the Gentiles. For so the Lord has commanded us, saying, I have made you a light for the Gentiles. In the midst of this opposition, I can't help but the light turned on for Paul in his mind, right? The Holy Spirit led him to understand this. He said, I have made you a light for the Gentiles that you may bring salvation to the ends of the earth. Now, sometimes things happen in Scripture that we don't get to see. Like, maybe we don't always appreciate fully what happened. Um, but, but here's what happened when the, the crowds had gathered and the Jews were like, hey, we're not going to listen to you. We're going to contradict you. Um, in this, uh, these events, in this opposition from the Jews, what happened was the calling on Paul's life to be the apostle to the Gentiles. It was confirmed in him. He realized that though a prophet had foretold this, it was actually going to come true in his life. And so he said, I've made you a light for the Gentiles that you may bring salvation to the ends of the earth. Y'all, it started in Jerusalem. And then a persecution broke out. It spread to Judea and to Samaria. And now here in the midst of another persecution in another city, another time where Saul was preaching the gospel, Saul realizes, hey, God is using these circumstances to, to direct me that I take the gospel to the ends of the earth. And what you may not see as you read this text, you may not fully appreciate, I believe firmly that we are sitting here today as beneficiaries of the fact that some Jews opposed Paul in Pisidian Antioch and God confirmed this call that he should take the gospel to the ends of the earth. And 2,000 years later, people are sitting in Poto, Oklahoma, Pecola, Oklahoma, worshiping Jesus Christ because God took the gospel to the Gentiles through a man named Paul. And so this is profound. Here's what I want you to know. If you choose to follow Jesus Christ, it's going to be costly. And you will face opposition. But what is gained will far outweigh anything it costs. If you could go back and have a conversation with the church at Antioch, those original believers who were enjoying that killer fellowship, awesome preaching by Paul and encouragement by Barnabas who were, you know, had those relational things, and you could say, hey, listen, 2,000 years from now, there are going to be people all across the globe gathering together. They're going to be worshiping Jesus Christ. And, and, and if you'll send Saul and Barnabas out, look at the result. Look at what's going to happen. Like God's going to do an amazing thing. That that church would say, absolutely, we will pay that cost all day long. We'll send them out. We'll do the thing. Like, yes, we're willing to do that. And if a few hundred years from now, you could look back on your life now. Maybe even at this very moment, you would look back to the time that you contemplated following Jesus Christ, whether it's trusting him, coming to faith in him to save you from your sins, or saying, God, here am I, send me. I want to make disciples too. If you could, you know, fast forward in the future, 100 years, and, you know, talk to yourself there. You would say, absolutely, pay the price, endure the opposition, because what you will gain will far outweigh any of the costs that you're going to endure. Look here in verse 48. When the Gentiles heard this, they began rejoicing and glorifying the word of the Lord. And as many as were appointed to eternal life believed, and the word of the Lord was spreading throughout the whole region. And it kept spreading, and it kept spreading, and it kept spreading, and it spread into Africa. It spread further into Europe. It spread into Asia. The gospel made its way to North America, and here we are today, beneficiaries of the gospel. So I want to maybe make this personal for you. 
If you're an unbeliever here today, I believe that Jesus Christ loves you, that God loves you, and that he is coming after you, that he wants to save you from your sin. He wants to to give you eternal and abundant life in him. He wants you to walk with him, to know the God of the universe, the one who created you, and he wants you to know the purpose for which you were created. And today, at the end of this sermon, just a couple of minutes from now, I'm going to give you a chance to surrender your life to Jesus Christ, to say, God, I recognize I'm a sinner and that I need a Savior. I know that you went to the cross, that you died on that cross to shed your blood as an atoning sacrifice for my sin. Jesus, I believe you're the Lord of the universe, and I want to follow you, right? So in a few minutes, I'm going to give you that opportunity to trust in him. But maybe you're here today, and you've been coming for church, coming to church for a while. You, you might have known this biblical story. You've read the Bible. You know the things. But as you look around your life, there's never been a time where you have begun to follow Jesus in his mission, seeking and saving that which was lost. Never begin to offer yourself in service to God to make disciples of other people. You've never seen your life as a mission, an opportunity to live for the Lord, but maybe you thought, you know, I'll just kind of love Jesus and go to church and kind of do the things, but I'm, I'm not here to spread it to others. Well, what I want you to know is that God has great things in store for you. It's not your power, by the way. It's the one who works within you. Uh, but, but God has called us and he sent us, he's commissioned us to go and make disciples. And so I'm going to invite you to offer yourself in service to the Lord, to follow Jesus in making disciples. And so that may look like somebody who's going to start teaching kids. I grew up in this church and one of our deacons uh, was teaching a, a class, a Sunday school class, when I was a little kid. And he probably did not know um, at that time how God was using him and how God was working through him. As a matter of fact, um, this Sunday school teacher once had to take me out in the hall and give me a whipping, uh, and I absolutely deserved it. I'm sure I was disruptive. I'm sure there were times where he's teaching and preparing, and he's doing all the things, and he's like, is anything good happening here? You know, like nobody's paying attention, and he might not have seen it. He probably faced some opposition from me, Right. And yet, uh, I stand here today, the beneficiary of someone who said yes to the call of Jesus Christ to make disciples by teaching a class. Y'all, he may not feel it, but my life has been forever changed, right? And you may not see the fruit of leading a middle school boys group upstairs or stepping out from the community that you get to live in, that you're loving it just like the church in Antioch. Man, you got people that are encouraging and walking with you to step away from that community and say, I'm going to lead out in a community of believers. I'm going to make disciples. And there are sacrifices that we make in following after Jesus, but I want you to know it will be worth it. What we gain far outweighs any of the cost. And so I don't know what God may be laying on your heart today. Maybe God's calling you to go overseas and serve in in missions. And this church wants to send you if he is, right? Uh, But maybe uh, God is just calling you to be a missionary in your office. That you would see that God has placed you there on purpose for a reason. He wants to use you. For both sets of people, believers, I've been a believer for a long time, and even the unbeliever today, I believe that Jesus Christ is calling us to follow him. Follow him in faith, all right, trusting him to save us from our sins, or follow him in seeking and saving that which is lost, where we seek to make disciples. But today, I just want to encourage you to say yes to Jesus, to follow him. So right now, would you bow your heads with me as we pray? Lord Jesus, I'm I'm thankful for your word and how you teach us. And I'm thankful that you're a God who loves us enough that you would sacrifice your son Jesus that we might find life. We might be live, live a life free of sin and walking with you and understanding who we are and who you made us to be. Lord, I want to lift up the person here who's never trusted in you. God, I pray that today would be the day they say yes. God, that they surrender their life and begin to follow after you. Lord, I want to pray for the person who's been living a pretty good Christian life, perhaps, but they've never really joined you in the mission. They're not following you in that regard. I pray that today is the day that they say yes. They offer themselves in service to you. And Lord, for both of those people, I pray that they would experience the full reward, the full benefits of following after you. And I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.